Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. And welcome to this 16th episode of Back Garden Biology and it's going to be about garden birds. Well it's going to expand out a little bit beyond garden birds because the theme is really about foraging. So how do birds go about feeding, getting the energy they need and what are the risks they run when they're doing that. And most of it is going to be about garden birds of course, it would be weird if it wasn't. And we're going to hear from Freddie who is a PhD student just finished in zoology. She's been studying some of the foraging tactics that garden birds use, particularly blue tits and great tits. She's been working up at Whiten Woods and we're going to hear a bit from her. But right at the end we're going to hear from Annette Faye. She's a junior research fellow and she works on puffins, which is probably the world's best job, right? And she looks at their foraging. They also have to go out to sea, find fish, feed their chicks and themselves and that can be quite a complicated business and she's got some great uh, footage of them going about their fishing. So that's at the end to look forward to. Now most of us have garden birds obviously, we don't live by the sea, and we feed them food. Lots of us do. I've got some different kinds of food here. This is one of the foods that I feed my birds. These are sunflower seeds. They've had all the shells taken off them and the birds much prefer that because they don't have to put so much energy in to, to feeding. So energy is really important to birds and if they have to spend a lot of time processing food that makes it a lot less attractive to them. What's amazing is I also have these seeds. These are Niger seeds and you can see they're really, really tiny. And you might imagine that that's not a good food for a bird. If you've got to pick up each one individually, that's going to be very time consuming. But goldfinches in particular really love those, bird, those seeds. And I think they just sort of hoover them up in quite large quantities rather than picking them up one at a time. And certainly I see them sitting on my feeder through the winter for hours on end, just gorging away on those. And then if you're a bit more adventurous, as well as these more normal kinds of food, you might also want to consider buying something like this. So these are freeze-dried mealworms, a bit horrible looking. But robins in particular really love them. And lots of gardens have a tame robin. My robin's not very tame, I'm always a bit disappointed. It comes out and sort of makes itself known to me and it wants some food. But as soon as I come out to give it food, it disappears off. But a bit later in the programme, I want to show some footage from my mum's garden. Now my mum has been feeding the birds for a long time and they have become incredibly tame. And she's built up generations of birds that have become incredibly tame. And if you put out mealworms in her garden, you aren't gonna sit around long before things come and get them. And actually, she doesn't just feed dried mealworms, she also feeds live worms and the birds go nuts for them. Okay so we're going to start off with Freddie talking a little bit about foraging then coming back to my mum's garden and seeing the amazing birds there and then ending with Annette Faye and her puffins. One of the many ways we study songbirds in white woods is we equip each individual with a little um, leg ring in which we um, put a electronic tech. So every time a bird comes to a bird feeder, we get a record of its ID and a time-stamped feeder visit. And this allows us to analyze their, their foraging behavior in really great detail. And so one of the things we found out is that birds differ in the way they use these feeders. There are binge eaters and grazers. So binge eaters are the birds that come to the feeder, eat as much as they possibly can, and leave and come back at a later time. Whereas the other individuals are um, grazing throughout the day. And the grazing strategy is considered more risky because the birds are repeatedly exposing themselves to potential predators. So if competition determines um, who can use the feeder in which way, then you would expect that individuals try to, to reduce competition and basically spread out and use multiple resources. But we don't find evidence for this, um, for individuals distributing themselves in such a way. Instead, we actually find that they 
um, move between food patches in a more or less coherent way and try to maintain cohesion with their flock members. And my own research actually showed that individuals would actively recruit other flock members to a food source when they have just discovered one. So you might ask, why, why would they recruit a potential competitor to a food source? So foraging the group brings benefits to each individual group member um, by reducing the predation risk. So by just foraging with one other individual in a group of two, I am already reducing my risk of being predated in case of a predation event by 50%. And in a group of five, I, um, my personal risk of being predated is only a fifth. Um, but you don't want to re uh, recruit um, too many other individuals because then competition again increases. So great, thanks Freddie. So a couple of weeks ago when the lockdown eased and we were allowed to go and visit our parents again, I went up to Macclesfield to my mum's garden and you can see that her bird feeders are much bigger, more impressive than mine. There's two wonderful sunflower seed feeders here together and these birds on those feeders are goldfinches and they're very distinctive with those red heads and those gold wing bars that give them the name. They've become quite common in gardens, they're one of those birds that are doing better in gardens now and you hear the twittering often as they go over. You can see they're also together and they often go around in flocks, especially in winter, with other finches too. That's what Freddie was talking about. It's reducing the risk of predation. Small birds are quite likely to get eaten by sparrowhawks and a sparrowhawk comes to my mum's garden at least once a week to pick off one of those small birds. Now this bird arriving at the sunflower seeds is something I never see in my garden and that is a nuthatch. It almost looks a bit like a kingfisher. Uh, the build of the bird, a big head and a long sharp beak, uh, but it lives in woodlands and it loves to eat seeds and nuts and it can walk vertically down trees which is a pretty impressive feat when you think about it. And speaking of woodpeckers, one of the other things my mum puts out to feed the birds is fat. It's plant fat, it's either coconut oil or peanut fat and this is a great spotted woodpecker. They nest nearby, they bring their young every year to my mum's garden, the young are feeding on the fat as well. They're a bit nervous and cautious before they start feeding and you see this jackdaw arrives and scares it off and it does this amazing defensive posture but it's decided it doesn't want to fight with the jackdaw and it leaves. I don't know whether the adult might have taken the jackdaw on but the baby wasn't prepared to. Now remember I told you that what's special about what my mum feeds as well is the live food. So here's me putting out some white wax worms and some mealworms all alive. The same number of each. I was kind of interested in what the birds preferred. So I put them all out on the ground like this, waited for a couple of customers. Here's the first robin arriving. You can see it does seem to prefer the wax worms, it doesn't take very many, but it eats one at a time and it eats them, swallows it, takes another one and then it disappears. And that's a bird feeding itself rather than taking food for its young. A little while later, a second robin appeared and it does something different. You can see it's trying to pick up every worm that it can see and it's sort of driving itself mad because it keeps dropping them because it speaks for, but it just can't resist trying to pick up every one that it can see. And eventually a blue tit just gets fed up of watching it and swoops down and just takes one from it. And my dad said he sometimes watched the blackbird literally trying to stuff 20 of these worms into its beak and driving itself mad because it can't fit them all in. Now finally what I did is I put out a little, a little pot and I just filmed it emptying. It took about three minutes, that's all, for a huge pot of these live worms to be totally emptied. I'm going to show it you speed it up. My challenge is to ask you how many birds come, what species can you see and can you even manage to count them? It's sped up quite a lot so I'll be impressed if you get this right. How did you get on? Well, I counted seven blue tits, 15 great tits, three robins, four dunnocks, just checking that, 
and a blackbird. Almost said a partridge in a pear tree, but I didn't see one of those. And if you enjoyed that music, that is the genuine sound of Prince Edward Island in Canada, where one of my PhD students, Christian Howard Norton, is uh, comes from, and he's there at the moment. Um, he had to go back there during the lockdown. So thank you so much to him for doing that brilliant piece of fiddling. It's a piece called St Anne's Creel. If you thought you were seeing house sparrows, by the way, you weren't. A dunnock it does look a little bit like a, a female house sparrow anyway, but they do kind of have a different way of walking and holding themselves, and they're not a sparrow at all, although they used to sometimes be called hedge sparrows. Hello, I'm Annette Fayet and I'm a seabird biologist, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about seabirds and how they feed. Seabirds are very different from other birds because they spend most of their lives at sea and actually that means they have to feed on fish. Some of them will catch the fish from the surface just flying above the water and catching it as it appears but others will actually dive sometimes very deep to catch prey. Now feeding can be a challenge for seabirds especially during the breeding season because that's the moment where birds have to be on land to build a nest and rear a chick but the fish remains at sea. So what they have to do is travel between the land and the sea to find fish for themselves and for the hungry chick. So how do they do this? Well, the first thing is that most of them are very good flyers and so that means they can fly very long distances pretty quickly at, at minimum costs. But another thing is that their chicks grow actually very slowly. Compared to garden birds, whose chicks might stay in the nest for a couple of weeks, Seabird chicks might take months before they can leave the nest and that's because they only fed maybe once or twice a day, sometimes actually less than once a day. And the parents have to make quite complex decisions when they want to decide where to feed. Because often near the breeding colonies where they are, they're not actually that much good food around and usually the good feeding patches are further away. So imagine you have a small supermarket with not very well stacked shelves nearby, maybe five minutes away from your house, or a much better, bigger supermarket with loads of choice and tastier food, but it's an hour's drive away. You can't always go to the one very far, it would just take too much time. Especially if you have a hungry chick that you need to feed as often as you can. And so seabirds solve this problem by alternating very short trips to the local area, which is not so good, and that's to feed that chick as often as possible, with occasional longer trips further out where they get better food, and that's usually for themselves. And that is called dual foraging. Now what's interesting is that actually both parents feed the chicks together, and we have noticed that the parents seem to alternate who's on which duty. So while one parent will be on short trips feeding the chick, the other one will go on a long trip to feed itself, and then they'll swap. And that way, that means the chick is never not fed for a very long period of time. Now, I studied loads of different seabird species, but my favorite and the one I know most is the Atlantic puffin. That's an Atlantic puffin here. They're very beautiful seabirds with a big, colorful beak, and you can find them all around the North Atlantic, including in the UK. But we don't know very much about their feeding ecology. By feeding ecology, I mean everything that has to do with feeding. Where they feed, what type of fish they eat, and so on. So to try and find out more about this, I did a study where we, we used these really, really, really small trackers here. They only weigh a couple of grams, and we put this on the back of puffins, and they'll measure for about a week where the birds are going to feed. And I also put some camera traps on the colony to observe the birds' behavior when they were coming back to the nest to feed their chick. And I'm going to share a few videos with you to show you what we found. So the first video illustrates um, the trips of a few puffins from Skomer Islands in Wales going out to feed at sea and every point on the, on the uh, video is a different bird. And you can see these birds actually go to feed quite far, even up to 75 kilometers away. That's 150 kilometers on a single trip to get food either for themselves or for the chick. Now the next video actually shows you a bird coming back to its nest with some fish in its beak for its chick and you can see it looks around and then it zooms into the burrow very quickly and you might wonder why that is. Well the answer is on the next video because actually there are gulls around the colony and they're just waiting for the puffins to come back to scare them off and, and steal their fish so the puffins want to come in in their nests before the gulls can get to them. And it's not just the big birds like gulls that do this 
the next video I recorded in Iceland and actually there it was the very small arctic tern that were mobbing the puffins to try and steal that ch their fish and as you see on this video they succeeded. Now this really helped us understand more about the feeding ecology of puffins but there was still one thing we didn't know and that was what the adults were actually eating because we can only see what they're carrying back to the chick. And to do this, we're actually collecting some of their poop. And you can see on this video, that's how it works. Um, and essentially what we did with this poop is we could look at the DNA in the feces and identify what prey these were. And that's called DNA barcoding. And we could actually work out what the adult puffin had eaten based on this. And actually what we found was that mostly the adults were eating the same thing as their chicks. And so by combining all these techniques, the tracking with the camera traps and the DNA barcoding, we could finally get insight into the feeding behaviour of these seabirds. OK, a huge thanks to Freddie and to Annette for sharing their research with us. I hope you enjoyed learning about that. And I hope you will be feeding the birds in your garden. You can still put out food at all times of year and the RSPB say that's OK. The parent birds know what they're doing and they generally won't feed their chicks anything inappropriate. I still have birds coming to my feeders, the young birds especially, they're fattening up. Around August time you see them really drop off and I don't quite know where they go, I think they go off to the countryside a lot and feed on other foods and the gardens seem to be empty but of course they'll be back come autumn and winter so get stocking up on food. So that's it from Back Garden Biology this week. I'm not quite sure how many more of these I'm going to make now that lockdown's finished but I do hope you've enjoyed watching them if you've been a regular viewer.